and we are broadcasting live. How's that? With a click of the button, we are in suddenly in everybody's houses, homes, living rooms, dining rooms, and probably bedrooms. It's very good to see the two of you here. And uh, gosh, they were lined up. We're already up to uh, 55 participants. And we've just opened the doors. So we'll give everybody a few minutes to, uh, to join us here. I'm Robert Wolanski, the communications director here, to, here at Heritage Auctions. Mm -hmm. Try saying that five times fast. And uh, obviously, everyone is joining us today for the State of the Jewelry Market Commentary, a discussion about what 2020 was like and what 2021 will be like. And we are joined by Jill Bergham, Senior Directory for Fine Jewelry in our Dallas office, and Gina D'Onofrio, the Directory of Fine Jewelry, who is in Beverly Hills, because she's very, very fancy. <laughs> it's nice to see the two of you. Thanks for being here. Well, good afternoon. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So I will tell everybody how this works real quick. And by the way, there's about 100 folks watching now. So uh, this is uh, one of our best attended state of the market commentaries we have ever had. And it only goes to show that I probably should be buying more jewelry than I currently am. Most definitely. Yes, Robert. Right. <laughs> so, uh, if you have a question for Jill and for Gina, as I assume you probably do, Feel free to drop it in the Q&A feature that Zoom obviously offers. Uh, I'm assuming everybody's well familiar with it by, by now. And I will relay the questions to Jill and Gina through the course of our next 45 minutes or an hour, or um, given the turnout, maybe two hours. You just never know. So we'll just have to see how things go. But I wanted to begin by asking Jill and Gina something that I had read just this morning. I had gone back and looked at some predictions for the market that came out a year ago. And in February of 2020, there was a market study that talked about the fact that consumers are increasingly comfortable with buying high-end jewelry online. And this was, again, in February of 2020. And they expected to see a significant increase over the next five years. But I'm, I have seen it firsthand. Gina, you and I have discussed this in the past about how the pandemic really accelerated that comfort level. And I'd like that to, uh, to be where we begin. Gina and Jill, if you could both discuss how surprised you were um, by what COVID has done to the jewelry market and where you expect it to be a year from now as opposed to where we are now. Robert, I, I'm so glad that you started with that subject because COVID has accelerated uh, technology and our interaction with technology at warp speed. And you mentioned over the next five years, you thought that interaction would increase. And what we're seeing at Heritage is that it has increased exponentially just in the first six months of COVID. And Jill, we were just talking about this yesterday. There's all sorts of reasons why people are participating more online in e-commerce and particularly with us and with our auctions. Um, what was one of the reasons, Jill? Um, well, I think we had stay at home orders. So people <laughs> were home and trying to figure out what to do with their time. Uh, it gave people an opportunity who maybe weren't as familiar with computers or shopping online to have the comfort from home to do the exploration, to become educated and feel more comfortable with the process. So that definitely impacted everybody across the board who's in e-commerce. Yeah, education is definitely key too, because the more that they learned about the product, the more they engaged they became and the more they felt that it was worthy of investment and participation. Yes. Um, and also we were on lockdown, so we couldn't travel. We couldn't spend money on other luxuries, um, going out to find restaurants. So, and then people were a little bit concerned about the future. So they wanted to um, redirect their, their money into wealth that was transferable, the, uh, into gold, into diamonds and gemstones. There were all types of reasons why people were participating. And interestingly enough, people were also taking stock of what they owned. They were all sitting at home looking at their jewelry collections and their collectibles and thinking, do I need this? I haven't Definitely. used it in a long time. Maybe it's time to sell this and then that will give me some money to buy this, which I really do want. And so there's been a lot of changes happening during COVID and there was a slowdown from March to May and then there was a huge uptick. 
And so much so that we had to respond very quickly. And fortunately we could because we, uh, we are a predominantly online auction company. So we could add a lot of smaller, more curated boutique style auctions. And one of them was the Friday Night Jewels auction that you have on your landing page there, Robert. Yeah, so I, I do want to get to that. Obviously, uh, we'll talk about how the adjustments were made and sales were made and things like that. But I do want to address one thing real quick, which is, you know, we have spent so much time here trying to discern sort of the many reasons for the increase in, in auction house traffic. Certainly, business has been uh, very successful in many categories. You've seen it in comic books every month. It seems to, to set a new record in coins as well. But I wonder for jewelry, it's something, you know, that, 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 to me at least, always seemed to be a thing where you wanted to go see the jewels before you bought it. You wanted to try it on, you wanted to see how it looked. And that certainly is, is something that you had to adjust to as well, right? So, Absolutely. So did you find that people were buying because they were traveling less and therefore they could buy a thing they always wanted, but may have been nervous about buying that thing without having actually held it in their hands. So how did you adjust to that? And sort of in your discussions with clients and consigners, what were some of the things in which they were the most interested in terms of trying to get to the next level with the jewelry business online? I think a big part of what we needed to do in terms of adapting to the market situation was take more advantage of um, videos, FaceTime, Zoom. I think all of the specialists and the team members here spent a lot more time selling individual pieces as well as the overall sale, trying to personalize the approach on an individual one-on-one -on -one client basis. And I think the work really paid off in the end. We, we found people became a lot more comfortable with the buying online process because they realized we were there to support them, to provide the information they needed so that they felt confident placing their bid and that they would be getting exactly what it was they were hoping for. Also, Jill and the team at headquarters worked very hard leading up to 2020 to create this online um, model type format so that when you looked at a piece of jewelry, and Robert, you've taken advantage of this in our previous previews, you could click on an image of a model wearing the piece. And it did help give the, the, the buyer a sense of scale of what something would look like on a piece. And fortunately, that was up and running by the time um, the pandemic hit and it just made the transition so much easier for our buyers. Right. Well, I'm also curious, what are some of the bigger hurdles that you had to overcome? You know, I, I assume that you would get calls from people who wanted to know, well, I'd really like to come see that, but, but I'd really like to, to, for you to come see this. How did you uh, overcome the hurdles that 2020 brought? Because obviously it was a difficult year for many, um, certainly whether it came to, to viewing or, or came to selling. It was difficult, not just for viewing, but also from the consigning perspective right. as well. So we took advantage of technology. There was no other way around it. I would um, try on a piece of jewelry, FaceTime on my phone um, so that a client could see it on the other end. Or with the help of strong lighting, I would hold the phone up to a gemstone and turn it in different directions so that they could get a sense of the variation of of color in a piece or, or scale of the three dimensionality that you don't see in a photograph and be able to answer questions and talk about condition. And the same thing happens on the other end uh, from a consigner's perspective. They're showing me jewelry. Um, again, technology is so much easier these days. Um, and that was a hurdle that our um, uh, uh, older clientele had to overcome. But um, with the help of other people in their family, they were able to utilize, utilize it technology a lot more and as Jill said they had more time to do it there was nothing else to do but stay at home and play with this so how did it change we're looking obviously here at the Friday nights Friday night lights auction that begins that opens for bidding on Friday uh, that the sale that takes place um, in a few weeks February 5th and and I wanted to talk to you about this because you know, you, you have added more sales because it does seem to approach more price points. This, uh, you know, they're, they're not just the enormous signature auctions with the million dollar diamonds in them. Here we see pieces estimated at three, four thousand dollars Certainly these are prices that one would expect when they go to a store. Uh, I'm just curious how uh, the decision was made to begin adding these and what the result has been. 
I think we were looking for a way to reach out to a larger number of people and again, make them, maybe it's a better word would be to say familiarize themselves with heritage and our auction platforms. We thought if we could bring about beautiful pieces that were within a more affordable price range, it might be easier for someone to treat themselves. We, with these sales, the design was to be a boutique, so a limited number of pieces. And hopefully uh, interested people would feel like they could afford the piece, they could treat themselves. Maybe they deserved it, it had been a long week of work. It had been a, a trial teaching their homeschooling their children. They, they deserved something, a reward for uh, staying home and everything that they were experiencing. So it's been a really fun process for us to bring this to the forefront. Gina, do you wanna add something to that? I think Jill hit the nail on the head there. I mean, we originally came up with this boutique concept before COVID. We had decided that Friday night, Jules, was the end of the week. Let your hair down, pour yourself a glass of wine, enjoy taking a look and look at pieces that are within a certain price point, a sweet spot, I felt, uh, where you could you could buy a beautiful piece of jewelry. And we, we put a lot of thought into what pieces we put in this particular sale. Um, but we were only going to have this sale three times a year. And then as soon as COVID hit, we realized, oh, no. Uh, it was such a huge success already that it made a lot more sense to replace one of our catalog auctions and then add a lot more of these Friday night jewels sales and it was the perfect antidote for people who wanted to have that escape once a month the first Friday of the month and they knew they would be able to log on and look at these fabulous jewels. Excellent. Somebody asked in the questions uh, how do they access this Friday night lights uh, jewelry online auction. Uh, it's at ha.com. All of our auctions are at ha.com. All of our online catalogs are there. So that's where you will go to find it. And um, you can find all the jewelry auctions there as well. Um, Actually, there's, an, there's a shortcut to that, Robert. You is. could go to ha.com slash jewelry. Right. And it'll take you to all our jewelry auctions. Right. But if you want to scroll all the auctions, here they are. The, um, I do want to, somebody asks in the Q&A as well. Has the demographic of the buyer changed in the last year? Yes. It's Excellent a question. question. Don't you think, Jill? I do think so, yes. We are seeing a, a lot of the younger crowd coming to auction and dipping their toe in the water, so to speak, which is a lot of fun. So yeah, we have, um, we, we've, been, um, we've been seeing a lot more um, engagement uh, in our social media. Um, in, in our Instagram, we, we not only have the Friday night jewels auction, we also have the Tuesday jewel box auction, which is in a price point that is one step down. And we're finding that our younger buyer um, who, who is looking for the gateway into buying jewelry at auctions is participating in those sales as well. And they be, they're able to find some beautiful jewelry in the 500 to 4,000 price range. Whereas the Friday night Jewels is, is starting at 2000 and up. And um, we are every time uh, we're, we're quite often posting images of upcoming jewels from both those auctions in our social media platforms. And uh, we're, we're getting a lot of response there. A colleague of ours points out that I keep referring to Friday night jewels as Friday night lights. And I know, I loved that. <laughs> I almost thought we should add that as a tagline. <laughs> A, it's fitting, but B, I'm a native Texan. I am in Texas, and uh, Friday Night Lights, for those who are not in Texas, refers to uh, Friday Night High School football games. So uh, there's certainly a film and a book about the subject, so I apologize for referring to it as Friday Night Lights, although uh, Friday Night Light, it, it's not necessarily um, that inappropriate for such spectacular and sparkling jewels as those available in the Friday Night Jewels auctions. So I apologize. Actually, the February 5th Friday Night Jewels, I believe the pieces are just loading on the website or have been in the last few days. So you should start be able, you should be able to start getting a preview to what's coming up. And I don't know, Jill, when is the bidding going to open for this? The 22nd. Ah, yes. End of the week. Right here. All right. Yeah. Right here, right here. It's begun to load. Um, I know we have a lot of things to look at, but the fact of the matter is we have a lot of questions. Uh, so we're here 
to, to answer folks' questions, and I'll just uh, begin asking them. Uh, Tracy asks, I'm a jewelry appraiser who is constantly asked, how do I sell my jewelry? How does consigning jewelry for sale to you work? Do you look for particular price points, or do you welcome all ranges of jewelry? I think that we offer a very broad spectrum of pieces, so we are a good overall resource. Uh, I'd say I'd start with the fact we're a wonderful sounding board with all of the different specialists we have, and we are very easy to work with one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll try to direct your pieces to the appropriate auction where we believe they will sell for the most money possible. Um, I believe also that during the pandemic, it would be convenient um, to set up a phone appointment, a video um, conferencing appointment with one of us. So if you have a collection rather than just one or two pieces, we can have a, a chat, just an introductory chat face to face. And if you lay out your jewelry on the table, you can turn the camera around onto the jewelry as we talk about it. And we'll be able to give you a sense of what we need to focus more on, what is a better fit for us. And if it is not, what is the best thing to do with it? So it's always good to start with an introductory conversation like that first. And if you're not comfortable doing a video conference, or video chat with your phone, with your smartphone, then just take some photos, general photos of the jewelry, and you can email any one of us and you can access us at ha.com slash jewelry and you can um, submit your inquiry there. Before we progress, I would like the both of you to give out your contact information now. We'll do that again later, but while we're on the subject, Jill and Gina, if you could tell folks how to get a hold of you, that would probably be very convenient for them. Certainly, you are welcome to email me, jillb at ha.com. It's a very easy one to, to contact me at, or my phone number is 214-409-1697, and I would be happy to speak with you. You can reach me at Gina D at ha.com. And uh, Robert, I also want to point out that we have jewelry specialists all over the country. And if you are in, um, in Chicago, for example, you would want to reach out to Jamie, um, Jamie Henderson. If you are in New York, you would want to reach out to Jessica or to Vera. Um, of course, Jill has Sabrina helping her in Dallas. And I have Anna Roblowski working with me at the Beverly Hills office. And Anna also covers the San Francisco office. So we have and Tracy, Tracy Sherman is also in Palm Beach. Tracy, how could I forget? Um, so we, we really do work hard at, at covering the continent. Um, and we, uh, we do travel from time to time, although with the pandemic, it's a little harder. But um, moving forward, this is not going to be the situation forever we can make plans to meet with you in your home state if if needed otherwise take advantage of the phone and video conferencing and i'm sure we'll be able to assist it's not at all surprising given the fact that we have about 120 people who are currently here that uh, there are going to be a lot of questions i'll ask two more before we jump uh, we move along uh, and we'll get to those questions in a moment somebody asked as we sit here looking at the uh, estimates for the friday night jewels auction that comes up on February 5th. How do you know that the price ranges you say uh, they are worth are actually what is, I guess they, they're asking, how do we come up with estimates? And uh, how do you know? Uh, well, I'll just leave it there because that seems to be really what the question is asking. We have a very specific auction crystal ball no, it's called research. We research. We look at very similar pieces that have sold at auction and we get a sense of what the market is willing to pay just by looking at recent results. This is not something that we fabricate. It's something that um, we set um, as um, an expectation just based on past performance. And uh, I'll ask this last one before we move along, and I'll get to them in a moment. Uh, do you partner with appraisers who can refer clients to you? Absolutely. We are more than happy to work with anyone who wants to direct clients to us. And that is, in fact, how we acquire a lot of our business. Uh, word of mouth and referrals and trusted people who have been happy with our services in the past. And that's the most rewarding for us. So we're going to, uh, we're obviously here to discuss the state of the market, 
So Bo asks a question that serves as a very good transition to uh, to looking at what we have lined mm -hmm. up. What trends are you seeing? Is gold selling or high-end sterling? Plus, are earrings selling because it's hard to wear a mask if you have dangly earrings? Which is certainly a question that I have asked myself repeatedly over the last 10 months. So uh, let's, uh, well, let's that's start That's like by three in one. That's a three for Bo. Good questions, though. So yes. Um, let's, let's start by looking at some of the things that have sold uh, over the last uh, year and then talk about why you think they're selling and what they mean for the uh, overall state of the market going forward. Well. First of all, we did talk about transferable wealth. And so people were, I mean, at, at one point in 2020, the stock market was all over the place and people were really concerned about what was going to happen with the economy. So they were looking to turn around and place their money into something that seemed more stable. And what we noticed was a, um, um, a very successful sales results with our fancy colored diamonds. Uh, what you're looking at here is our 25 carat fancy vivid um, diamond that sold in our October catalog auction. And that one there, let's see, what did that one go for, Jill? 975. Oh, thank you. Just yes. shy of a million. Just shy of a million. Just shy of a million. Oh, my goodness. And it was a spectacular diamond. But, you know, up until then, we were hearing in the trade that, oh, fancy diamond, fancy yellow diamonds have softened. Nobody wants them anymore. But uh, this was obviously proof that it was quite the contrary. If you had something special, something that uh, was rare, um, it was worth putting your money into. And then if you move on to some of our other examples, Robert, you'll see we have a range of fancy colored diamonds. And this one, oh, Jill, you have quite a story with this piece. Yes. But um, it's aside from the, the personal aspect of it, what was fascinating about this was it was a fancy gray blue diamond that sold at a record price of close to 200,000 a carat, which was very similar to what a fancy blue diamond had sold just a few years ago. But Jill, this was this is very special, wasn't it? It was it was wonderful. Not only was it a, a gorgeous piece to behold in person, but it was a case where auction really can help people. You you look at it and you say, oh well the buyer acquired something that they loved, but we should also look at the other half of the story or the other half of the equation. And that is all about the consigner. And while we do maintain the privacy of our consigners, there are certain things that we can share, like the fact that this ring had passed through generations of a family, that the women in the family all had blue eyes. So that's reflected in this gem. And that the owner really didn't want to sell the stone but based on the pandemic and COVID, uh, stay at home, the changes in lifestyle and a, a desire to retire and move on with her life, she, you know, with a heavy heart, agreed to sell the diamond to change her future. And when we started the discussions, the diamond went in with a pre-auction estimate of 50 to 75,000. So it meant the world to her and to the entire jewelry team and to Heritage to know that when the hammer fell and this ring realized over $220,000, uh, that we changed her life. We'd made a big impact. And that's, that's the type of treasured memory that I will always hold on to, no matter how long I'm in this business. I have to say, when I heard that story, I believe this was a teacher as well, is am I correct? Yes. About that? Yes. When I heard this story, it for the first time since I had been here in the last 10 months, it reminded me of the real personal connections um, that, that, that consignment directors uh, and heritage has to the clients uh, that it serves, uh, that there is a great responsibility that goes along with uh, consigning these pieces and selling them. So um, I think folks should probably not take, uh, take it for granted that there are people, there are people who actually care about um, those who are consigning it's not just a, a thing to sell but it is a, a, a I think a all of all of the specialists feel an amazing overwhelming responsibility towards our clients and we'll work harder because we care and um, this this ring is just the pinnacle for me it, it really truly was a remarkable piece and a great story there were a lot of tears being shed when Jill shared that story with us we were so happy to hear it 
And if you're listening, um, we're very, very happy for you that you were able to yes. have such a successful sale with this ring. Thank you for trusting us. You know, that's an interesting thing. You bring up the issue of trust. And I do wonder, you know, in the last 10 months, if you have found that, that, that you do have more people coming to you for these very reasons, because they do, they see the success that these pieces are having, but they also trust that you will take care of them. And that, that, that's a more difficult thing, I would think, to, uh, to impart uh, over the phone or over, or, or over video. And I assume that that's probably one of the, the roadblocks you've had to deal with as well. You know, that's the unique nature of auctions. When you approach us to um, take responsibility uh, of your piece and, and sell it at auction, we're also not just emotionally invested because we've got to know you and we do care about you as a consigner, but we also want to succeed because the more we sell it for, the more you sell it for and everybody wins. It's a very transparent process. Um, we are, it's important for us to get the most um, amount of money, most possible amount of money for your piece. Um, and it's, uh, it's not something where you're going to hand it off to somebody, receive a check and then not know what happens to it after that. Uh, auctions are definitely um, worth pursuing for that reason alone. I think we provide a, a very safe platform for people who are interested in selling because we do protect their privacy and uh, heritage. We, we do all the work for somebody. So whether it's cleaning the jewelry, um, having stones certified, having repairs done, dealing with the incoming questions and the photo approvals to processing the payments. It, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that most people aren't familiar with and honestly don't need to be. I think for the consigner, they need to be comfortable, they need to be happy, and they need to know that we are going to work incredibly hard with their best interests at heart. It is a shared success, as Gina pointed out. Did you want to look at some, uh, I know you wanted to talk about a few more colors. Well, as far as market trends, yeah, I thought it was very interesting what's being ha what's been happening with the color gray in gemstones. And so this gray modifier in diamonds, we looked at the gray blue diamond before, and this one here, uh, this particular diamond, we, we called it a, a fancy um, gray blue diamond, uh, or gray, bluish gray, it, it didn't have a GIA report. Um, the two pink diamonds on either side were submitted and deemed to be natural pink diamonds, but because of the nature of the setting, it was too risky to unset that diamond and submit it to the GIA. So, uh, but nonetheless, it had a very strong gray overtone to the blue. Um, and it was very successful, surprisingly so. Um, I believe this one sold, yeah, it was a carat 25 and it sold for 162,500. Uh, without a GIA report. So there was some speculation going on there. And the other thing that I'm seeing is the gray overtone that's being, uh, that's become popular in, in gray spinels or slice diamonds, gray slice diamonds. There is, um, people are looking to alternate colors to the typical fancy colored diamonds or fancy colored gemstones. And uh, gray is one of them that's become quite popular. You know, you bring up a point that somebody asks a question about. Given that there is a limited or no in-person inspection of the pieces, what, adjust, uh, what adjustments, I'm sorry, have you made to condition reports that you supply? Has this been a more intensive process? And is there an example you can provide of how you manage this aspect? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think that we did try to add more information into the condition reports. Uh, certainly all of the certificates that we have for stones are available online. Uh, Gina made a very good point. The ring was submitted to GIA. And while we could not remove any of the stones, it was an interesting process to find out that they were able to identify the pink diamonds as natural color, but they couldn't determine the blue. And it, it was just a, a fascinating experience for all of us to be a part of. And that did lead to more people making requests for additional photos, videos. Uh, there were more calls for in-person inspections, which were taken very seriously. Uh, gloves and masks were required. Jewelry was washed over and over again. Um, 
Yes, it, it was a real challenge to get the pieces out in front of people. Let's move on. Uh, there's another fancy light pink diamond. Yep, just uh, this one was just over or just under 10 carats? Just over. 1002, 1002 mm -hmm. right. And again, it was it was hugely successful. So um, we uh, those in the jewelry industry are aware that uh, we recently had our uh, a very a very large source of fancy color diamonds, fancy pink diamonds, the Argyle Diamond Mine in Australia, recently closed, and this has also placed a lot more interest. Um, on fancy pink diamonds and what's going to happen to the market and what's going to happen to the prices of these diamonds. So we do expect a lot more activity happening with fancy pink diamonds. And this is one example here. This was not an Australian diamond, it was not determined to be, but it was a fancy pink. And the overall supply of this color is now going to be reduced due to the closure of that mine. So uh, somebody has asked here, we have a lot of questions. Uh, somebody asks here, gosh, I'm trying to, to, to are, are sa Lucy asks, are sales now focused more on specific designers? Are buyers interested in stones that are better quality or larger and are trendier right now, like emeralds? So it, it's as though she has written our commentary for us. Gina and Jill, I will uh, let you take that. Yes, Jill. Interesting. I, I think that some designer brands have maybe risen more to the, the top tier of interest uh, for our clientele. But at the same time, we're also seeing that because lifestyles are more casual, a lot of just wearable jewelry, what's easy to wear for your Zoom meeting? Comfortable earrings, an, an easy necklace. Um, you know, we, we laugh that we're all dressing from the waist up. And so it's been really fascinating to see that casual jewelry, whether it's signed or unsigned, is rising in popularity. What's easy to wear? What's comfortable? Yes, nobody can see my fuzzy slippers right now. <laughs> no, but a couple so, of people have asked about your brooch, Gina, so we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. We'll tie that into what's what's coming up in 2021. There Definitely. you go. But here, obviously, yeah. we have the uh, the Peretti for Tiffany, and we, we do have several pieces here that you pulled that uh, well, you want. Yeah, to yeah this is another example of wearable jewels. This is also designed by uh, Peretti. No, Angela Cummings for Tiffany. Cummings. Right, we have Peretti here. Um, yes, I'm looking at Peretti. And uh, that cuff, that bracelet is mixed metal. It has gold, it has silver, it has iron, um, almost like a, um, um, a shikudo style. Um, uh, where the metals have been rolled together. And this bracelet um, th and this type of look is really popular because you can wear this casual. You can have your yoga pants on and a t-shirt and, and this bracelet would be appropriate. It's also very thin and flat, so it's very comfortable to wear. And um, as Jill uh, alluded to earlier, it's difficult to wear long earrings with a mask and sometimes wear earrings at all with a mask. Um, so no, the focus has shifted away. Um, I think Bo was asking that question earlier too, where, you know, the focus has shifted away to people wearing a necklace or a brooch or a nice ring. And I know with my, my jewelry uh, appraiser friends and jewelry specialist friends, we'll FaceTime each other and we'll be wearing some, some fabulous jewels just at home because it cheers us up. Um, when we're not wearing the masks. So that's when the earrings do come on, by the way. Um, but yes, wearable jewels is definitely uh, the direction. This is the market trend that is happening. We're finding that people have moved away from huge bling and they're going more towards uh, mixed metals, gold. Uh, they're putting money in gold because the price of gold has spiked so much. Um, it, 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 it seems to be um, a, a safer place to put your money and people are putting it into some fabulous big gold bracelets and chains. Um, and uh, we're also seeing uh, jewelry with uh, gemstones adorned with hard stones, not flashy stones. So we'll have some examples of that coming up. So we'll return to that theme. Um, uh, and then you mentioned designer brands. Well, some designer brands are never going to go away. And here is one example right here. Uh, Jill was very much involved in this, this fabulous collection that we took in and I'll let Jill speak to this. 
um, and it will uh, tell you about some of the designer brands that are that are just forever strong. We were very fortunate last year to have an amazing collection of Tiffany jewels come to auction, and whether they were beautiful designs that were not um, single stone based or examples such as this ring where there's an absolutely stunning Zambian emerald. Uh, it, it was just fun because it crossed the lines and appealed to a much wider audience. Those who prefer the artistic side of jewelry and also then those who prefer the gems and the really rich, big, more single stone type effects uh, just represented here. Also, there's a push away from gemstones that are treated. Um, everybody is very interested in what has been done to sapphires and emeralds. Have they been uh, heat treated or have they been fracture filled? What's what's happening to them? And, and the market has responded to this in a big way. And they want uh, gemstones that have not been uh, played with or altered in any way. Um, although that is very difficult to find. They're incredibly rare. And during COVID, the supply chain for these types of gemstones is restricted. It's really hard to, to get good quality gemstones and diamonds because the mines are not as active, the shipments, uh, the, the, the cutting centers are not as active. So it's difficult to get this type of item. So people have turned to the secondary market as an excellent source for fine jewelry and gemstones. This is one that you had uh, wanted to discuss, and uh, it's interesting, I, you know, to, as we as we discuss the last year, it's interesting to see the nine hundred and seventy five thousand dollar piece, the four the forty three hundred dollar piece. It really is a or the uh, the cup that was just for a little over two thousand. It really is an extraordinarily wide range of offerings uh, in the jewelry category these days. There is, and, and we, we selected this picture because Jill made a really good point um, about this emerging trend. It's been emerging for a while, but now I think it's really picked up steam of, of upcycling, Jill. Yes, it, it is about uh, acquiring older pieces and you know upcycling meaning giving them a new life. And that way you're not out there supporting digging up new diamonds and hurting the earth. And it, it's like, what's already out there that we can either enjoy as it is or repurpose to become something that we want it to be, whether that's inheriting a piece from a family member and their legacy lives on because we've reworked a piece. So it's more to our particular taste than it was to that person's, but yet you carry a piece of them with you. The, the jewel always tells a story and we're, we're sort of the caretakers of it while we have it, whether it's us at auction, having the piece for a few months or the people who own it, um, the jewelry lives on. So that's that's a lot of fun, I think. It's, it's a fascinating thought process if you wanna go explore it further. Yeah, it also plays into that social consciousness that's happening right now. People want to uh, stay away from uh, gemstones that have, um, that are not sourced ethically and they are not funding any type of, of terrorism. They're looking for uh, gold that has been ethically sourced. And that's really hard to, to determine right now because the jewelry industry is still catching up. They're still trying to find ways to be accountable for where their jewelry and gemstones come from. So once again, the market is turning to pre-owned jewelry. And then we're also finding designers. Jewelry designers are coming to us um, looking for a good source of diamonds and gemstones with antique cuts or uh, antique jewelry that can be repurposed, like, for example, diamond crescent brooches that can be converted into necklaces and stick pins that can be converted into rings. We're, we're seeing all kinds of wonderful creative applications for pre-owned jewelry. Um, Robert, what you're showing right now is something that I hope nobody ever tries to repurpose, though. This is an absolutely extraordinary um, Renaissance revival um, enameled uh, diamond uh, pearl um, cross pendant. And the reason why we selected this and the piece that we had prior to this was um, this upcycling is also playing into a trend that's happening right now. There is a new um, interest 
a, well, it's not new, it is a revived interest in antique jewellery, antique and period jewellery, uh, because um, everybody's, again, at home, they're watching TV, they're watching all these fabulous period uh, costume period shows. Uh, some of them are dating to the early 19th century, the most recent one. Um, this is base, This is actually, um, let's attribute these images. This is uh, the landing page of Vogue, British Vogue, and they are featuring this, uh, the Netflix uh, series called Bridgerton, which was set in the early 19th century. And the jewelry and the costumes that have come out of this show um, are very much playing into this, this emerging trend of Georgian, Victorian jewelry. And um, this is something that had taken a back seat up until recently. Um, but now we're seeing a revived interest in it. And we're also seeing, oh, look at this incredible mid-Victorian um, silver and gold necklace with, um, with enameled um, uh, Limoges type enamel in the center. A incredible piece. And I believe this piece we sold with the original fitted box, didn't we, Jill? We did, yes. Yeah, it was extraordinary. So, um, but not just Victorian jewelry. We, we don't have links to it, but you know, there are other shows like The Marvelous Miss Maisel, which was focusing on the 1950s and 60s. And then we had The Queen, which was, you know, it ran the gamut from the um, mid um, 20th century up until current times. Um, this is a mid Victorian snake necklace. So there is a revived interest in period vintage and vintage jewelry. And we're really excited because that's something that that we do represent beautifully at auction like saying everything old is new again it's all come back around full circle so it is nice to see pieces such as this item this snake um, live on and be popular again well it's fascinating Jill, uh, gina and i've talked about this a lot in the last uh, few months of doing some of these zoom previews about the fact that uh, one day a piece from the 1960s or 1970s may be popular in a way that it wasn't uh, over the last few years. It, you know, I, I am fascinated by the fact that pieces go in and out of style but never seem to fall out of favor. This is a perfect example that you have right here. I picked this watch for two reasons. Um, we wanted to talk about emerging trends. So this, this touches on wearable gold um, it touches on the fact that Piaget in the 1970s created this line of, of, of beautiful gold jeweled watches that had hard stone inlay. So this one has a tiger eye inlay in the dial. Um, and at one point, Jill, I'm sure that you would agree, at one point, nobody wanted to touch this type of design. It ended up on the melt pile maybe 20 years ago. And nowadays, nobody can get enough of it. 1960s, 1970s, and now 1980s jewels are becoming more collectible. And hard stones and a departure from flashy gemstones is, is one trend that's emerging as wearable jewels. And what you're clicking on right now is a whole series of beautiful jewelry designed by a Native American modernist jeweler um, called Charles um, Loloma. And his pieces today, these were created in the 60s and 70s, are highly collectible. They are, uh, they are um, experiencing a whole new revival and people are paying top dollar for this type of jewelry now. And these were some of the pieces that we sold last year in our single owner sale. Um, and hard stones in general. Van Cleef and Arpels was using hard stones and David Webb in the 60s and 70s. All this jewelry is hot now. And again, I mentioned the marvelous Miss Maisel and the Queen and some of these other period shows. Um, people have now moved towards jewelry of the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. And I believe the next tab that you have coming up is for, um, yes, Kuczynski. This is iconic late 60s, early 70s, very little diamond, very sculptural, very modern. This is a great British designer. Um, some of the great British designers were also Andrew Grima and Tom Scott. These types of jewelry designers are now becoming the new collectibles and you may not pay as much for them right now. They're coming up at auction, but uh, believe me, this is a very strong emerging trend. And uh, the piece that you commented on that I'm wearing right now is not signed, but it is 
beautifully made and it is another example of 1960s late 60s um very textural uh, modernist type jewelry all right to that point and we have a lot of questions lined up and i want to make sure we get to most of them if not all of them uh i, I said we'd be here about an hour so I, I assume we may be here then or a little bit longer but somebody says i see gina is wearing quite a large brooch with uh, not too many brooches listed in the upcoming auction and those shown appearing smaller, in your opinion, what is the market currently for larger, more flamboyant brooches? They never died. We have people who want to make a statement with a brooch. Um, and fortunately, we're seeing people wear brooches in different applications, not just on a lapel anymore. Um, Jill, I'm sure that you could speak to this as well. Um, they're wearing them um, at the waist. Absolutely. Wedding. Gathered yeah. dress and waist if you're wearing a summer dress, yes. on a strap. Could wear them in your hair as a hair ornament. And, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that brooches are not just for ladies. We see a lot of men, Billy Porter, a lot of people are wearing brooches. And Elton John has a huge collection of brooches. You know, and it's, it's just, it's a fun accessory. It's a way to make anything have a little bit more flair. We were talking about social consciousness earlier and um, something that I did want to touch on was diversity, not just diversity in jewelry design, but diversity in the people wearing them. And uh, this whole kind of gender um, crossing that um, jewelry doesn't necessarily have to that be worn by a specific gender anymore. And this is something that is being embraced in the younger generation. And we're delighted to see some of our, our male customers wearing fabulous brooches. And that's where we're seeing some of the smaller brooches being worn. Um, men are, are adopting some, some very stylish, smaller Art Deco brooches and very tasteful statement pieces. And I believe we've got a series of photos coming up with one of our um, our male um, employees uh, uh, suiting up and, and wearing some great brooches that we have coming up for auction, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. I'm just disappointed no one asked me to participate in that photo series. <laughs> Next time, Robert. There's Next always time. another occasion. <laughs> yes. I have been yes. looking for an excuse to wear brooches in public, yet no one has ever made me that offer, if only. Yes. Um, all right, so Jill, uh, G uh, Gina, you and I have actually discussed this in the past as we've done some of these. Uh, Elizabeth asks, what are your thoughts about man-made diamonds? Are they going to uh, devalue mined diamonds eventually? Oh, that's a tricky subject. I, I think that uh, man-made diamonds will eventually come to the marketplace, the auction marketplace specifically. I think right now we're a little bit behind in in that uh, trends take a while before they come to auction. So what we're seeing in the current market might take a couple of years, maybe five years before it starts coming to our area. And then you're right, it's gonna be a big decision for auction houses to determine what they choose to represent or not. I think that's a that's a big discussion that we will be having moving forward and, and trying to value those diamonds uh, is going to be a real challenge. And the market, that, sorry, Joe. Oh, my apologies, go. No, finish your thought. No, that was it. I was just going to say the market shifts quickly with regard to the laboratory grown diamonds. And so it makes it very, very challenging. In, in the trade, this is this is a constant source of discussion because everybody's very closely monitoring the price of man-made or laboratory grown diamonds. The prices have been falling because there are more and more diamond growers coming on the marketplace competing with each other. So the prices are steadily declining. Maybe they will plateau at some point, but we haven't seen that happen yet. Um, what we are finding is at first, the natural diamond market was, was really kind of 
taken aback. They didn't quite know how to deal with this. And we also found that because of uh, uh, the pandemic and a lot of um, the supply chain being restricted at first and retailers not being able to sell their, their, their goods because they didn't have an online presence, we saw a softening of the colorless diamond market. Um, that was happening in April, May, June of 2020. But then after that, we started to see the price of natural colored diamonds start to increase. And I believe that now we're almost fully recovered. And so if we're going to predict what's going to happen in future, do I think that man-made diamonds are going to impact the natural colored diamonds? No. I don't think so, um, because I think that there is a limited supply of natural colored diamonds. And in fact, that supply is almost going to uh, come to an end in a couple of decades. And people are speculating on that. Uh, if you are looking to take advantage of the softened colorless diamond market, now is the time to be putting your money into them as the market recovers. Um, but there's always going to be a place for man-made diamonds, just like there was a place for man-made sapphires and rubies and cultured pearls versus natural pearls. Um, all right. So I, let me ask you this real quick. This is my own question. Is there, and I, I hope this is helpful for everyone. Is there a part of the market that you find is undervalued at the moment that you would recommend folks invest in uh, at the moment that you think will rebound significantly in 2021? Ooh, I don't know. Gina, do you have an opinion on that one? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's the problem. Always have an opinion. Um, so, all right. We, we were talking about period jewelry and the, uh, the renewed interest in Victorian. Georgian jewelry has taken off. The millennials uh, really appreciate the sentimentality of Georgian jewelry, woven locks of hair in jewelry, the sentimental pieces. Um, what has waned a little bit is the art deco jewelry. And I believe that if you have an eye or you have an expert next to you, I mean, take advantage of all the jewelry specialists at Heritage, um, buy some fine quality art deco jewelry because that is bound to return again. Um, and it is experiencing a little bit of a lull right now. We will get back to the questions. Um, actually, here's a complaint. I'm just going to give you this one right now. Uh, Regina says the 8 p.m. schedule for the auctions is quite difficult for European buyers because of the time difference. The auction starts at 3 a.m. Uh, could the start time be a little bit more friendly for the European buyers? So I guess that is a question I've had since I've been here. How do you determine when you want to start some of the auctions? Because our, our, uh, our clients, uh, more than 1.4 million at the moment, uh, are scattered throughout the world. That's, again, that it's really hard. We have tried to change the times, whether it's the Tuesday night auctions, the Friday night auctions, or our big signature catalog auctions. And it, it sounds awful to say we, we just can't find a time that suits everybody. The, the world is such a big place. And it's been great that the internet has made it a very small and accessible place. But we, we haven't found the magic time clock yet. So uh, we appreciate questions like that and comments because it, it makes us think more moving forward. Yes, definitely. And Regina, until we try and find that magic time slot, if there is one, you can always take advantage of advanced bidding and place your secret maximum bid so that you don't have to stay up um, uh, in the middle of the night to bid on something that you're interested in. Um, the bidding will take place only in increments if somebody is bidding against you. Judy asks, how do you make an offer on a piece that does not sell during an auction? If pieces fail to sell the day of the auction, they are available for a week after the sale on our website. And you can either contact the jewelry team independently, or you can work just through the website in order to make an offer or purchase that piece directly. Offers are considered if they're within reason. And I, I guess I would take it a further step and say, even pieces that have sold, there is an option for make an offer to owner on our website for anyone who might not be familiar with it. So if a piece sold and maybe you forgot to bid or times change and a year later you say, gosh, 
I forgot I was interested in that piece. I wonder if it's still available. There is an option to make an offer to the person that owns it. It is done anonymously with Heritage as the point group making a transaction occur. And that's a very easy process. And it can prove to be a lot of fun if there's a piece that you really liked and maybe it, it slipped through your fingers at a given time. Uh, we have still more than 120 people who are here. So uh, I'm going to keep asking you their questions on their behalf. Lucy wonders, it's such a silly question, but I'm always reluctant to purchase pieces until I have tried them on. Since a lot of the auctions are headquartered in Dallas and I'm in LA, what do I do? Gina, I assume you will go over to Lucy's house and show them to her personally. Oh, I wish I had that luxury. Um, but, but somebody in Dallas can try it on for you and take some photos. Um, maybe you could relay in an email to us what, uh, what your stature is, if you're tall, if you're, you're, you're petite, and we can try and find a member of staff that, that matches your build to try it on for you. Um, it really does help to see it on somebody's wrist. And, and I buy at auction too, obviously. I'm wearing pieces I purchased at Heritage Auctions. And, and the earrings, for example, that I'm wearing right now, I purchased in our Tuesday jewel box. And there's no way that I could have seen them because the earrings were in Dallas. So I did ask somebody in Dallas to try them on and take some photos. And it really did help me to imagine what it would look like on myself. Um, if it's the Friday night jewels auction or our signature auction, the Friday night jewels auction, you can see the pictures on our models photographed. And with the signature auction, you're in LA. So you can come to our previews. We have, um, we have three catalog auctions a year and we do send um, invitations to our public previews and with the full uh, restrictions, safety precautions in place for COVID, um, you are able to come and, and safely uh, by appointment, uh, sit down uh, with, with the proper protections in place and look at the jewelry that you're interested in. So if you are not on our invite list, send us an email and we'll make sure that you receive an invitation to the preview. And while you're on that point, Gina and Jill, please give out your email addresses one more time and we'll do it a third time before we get done. But go ahead and let folks know how to get a hold of you. Absolutely. You're more than welcome to reach me, Jill B at ha.com. And Gina D at ha.com. Uh, we'll wrap this up here shortly, but somebody asks, um, I'd like to know the quality of the gems. How do I get that information? Again, that's much of that is on the online auction page. If it's not there or that you have further questions, you can reach out to Jill and Gina. See, there's a question I can answer. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. I also had some questions emailed to me and one of them was an interesting one. I had somebody who loves enamel jewelry and um, it, enameled period jewelry. So there might be some damage to the enamel and she wanted to know how to go about getting the enamel work repaired. And it's a very good question because most people are not skilled in this type of restoration work. So you do have to be very careful who you take your piece to for repairs. I don't know where the person lived, so I was not able to direct them to anybody. And I certainly don't know an excellent enamelist in every city in the world. So I would suggest that um, you reach out to your, um, if you're in the US, reach out to a local um, appraisal organization like the NAJA, National Association of Jewelry Appraisers. And I believe some of you are watching. Hello, fellow appraisers. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. Um, or you could reach out to one of the other associations as well, the American Society of Appraisers or International Society. And they, the, the specialists there are, are, are tapped into what the good workshops are around the country and should be able to help you, um, should be able to direct you or contact us. Um, and if we know somebody that is in your city, we can certainly help you as well. Um, I'll ask a couple more questions here. There have been many, and I'll, I will send them to Gina and to Jill to answer as well if you didn't get them answered here, or you could email them to Jill and Gina yourself. Um, someone asked about our photographs. Uh, all the photos are done in house, so we make sure that everything is uh, up to spec. We make uh, videos, so we, as, as Jill and Gina have said repeatedly, since you cannot come visit us, we want to make sure that everything is as clear as it possibly can be. So it's almost like you're holding that particular piece. 
Somebody does want to know, uh, Camarina asks, I'm seeing much less of a market for statement for artisan pieces. What might explain this? For statement artists? For, for art, yeah, for, 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 for big pieces, by, for, for uh, I assume it, it's probably um, less well-known designers, for instance. Do you, how, how do you handle, I guess I would ask this, how do you handle those pieces? Uh, obviously we're seeing Tiffany here. Some in, Somebody actually asks, do you ever see Heritage hosting a designer costume jewelry sale featuring the 1960s and 70s pieces by Yves Saint Laurent, Givenchy, Dior, and so forth? Um, sort of sort of where is the market outside of the pieces that we've talked about and looked at and discussed today? I think the costume market has so much to offer. There are amazing designs, wonderful makers, um, both working currently as well as past. And I think it's a challenge at an auction house for us because we do offer so much and we've really had to narrow down and try to uh, firm up what we do. So we say we offer fine jewelry. Uh, Heritage is currently, in terms of the jewelry department, not working with costume or as much silver jewelry as we used to. Now that doesn't mean the company does not work with it at all. It means that we might direct somebody to our silver department, in particular, if they have uh, Mexican silver designer jewelry, if they have George Jensen, if they have um, a Calder piece, certainly Heritage is interested. We just wanna get you to the right department. And the same could be said for certain costume elements. They might be able to be handled by our luxury department because there is a market. It, it's about uh, who can handle it the best. Yes, the goal is to sell it to the highest bidder um, and, and market it to the person that's truly interested. So the colder piece that um, Jill mentioned, that's something that would probably sell in our design sale. Um, and, you know, people who are more interested in, in the artist jewelers. And that's why I was wondering, Robert, if you meant artist jewelers like Calder, like uh, Picasso. Um, yes, we do handle that, but with the right department and the right audience. Um, pieces that are not signed, but well made um, and represent a, a particular uh, decade, um, we definitely go to the trouble of explaining what it is um, and the photographs front and back of a piece. We use a lot of photographs so that you can see the piece at every angle and get an appreciation for how well it's made. Um, and we do try and circuit date these pieces. So um, these days with every, oh, here's a perfect example, late 1970s, uh, early 80s, David Webb. Yes, this is signed David Webb. This is one of those collectors that everybody wants. But there were a lot of other makers at the time inspired by David Webb designs that were producing this look, but they weren't signing their pieces. And if they're well made, there's nothing wrong with buying a beautifully made piece as long as you're buying it right. And if you're buying it at auction, you do have the advantage of the specialist's eye taking a look at it and giving you a second opinion. And also we do put a lot of information in the description and the catalog notes. All right, we're going to go to the speed round now. Are you finding changes? Uh, Duncan asks, are you finding changes in interest in more unusual gemstones? Finding more interest in unusual gemstones. Yeah. Are you so finding I, folks are more interested in something that is more unusual or rare when it comes to gemstones? And I guess I could couple that with a question that is asked by uh, somebody else, which is, what is going on in the colored stone market? How is ruby and sapphire's market pricing trending? And what about the star sapphire and star ruby? Hmm. I would say that for us, we've had a lot of interest over the past year in Paraiba tourmaline. That has been a, a gem that in particular has been in demand and done quite well in our auctions. We've also seen an uptick in an interest in star sapphires, most definitely. Um, Gina, what do you think? I, I think on rubies and emeralds, you know, we, we saw well, a little bit of a cooling, perhaps. Well, people are looking to diversify and they're also looking to more affordable gemstones. So um, I was surprised to see uh, 
a huge interest and I was delighted too because being Australian I'm particularly interested in Australian opal so I saw a huge uptick in uh, prices for Australian opal what people are willing to pay more more and more designers in the retail sector are designing for these opals and also we're seeing an uptick in the secondary market I was surprised to see a lot of interest in morganite I didn't know that there was so much interest and we have had quite a lot of success at auction with that. Um, I've seen more interest in tanzanite. Um, and fortunately, we've had a good supply of beautiful tanzanites coming up for auction. So if you are a fan of tanzanite, you should definitely uh, keep an eye on our Friday night jewels auctions and our signature sales because there's more to come. Um, and aquamarine has experienced an uptick. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, people have moved away to um, so more unusual colors, like, for example, gray spinel. Red spinel is already a hit. Um, that was that was the new hot gemstone a couple of years ago, and now it's very hard to get a hold of fine red spinel. And now people are looking at all the different colors of spinel, and particularly gray and lavender. Jill, somebody asks, what kind of tourmaline did you say? Paraiba. Uh, it's often, you know, a, a shade that runs anywhere from a, a greenish blue to a scope green or really vibrant blue. And we've been very fortunate to have some incredible examples. Uh, Robert, who is not me, asks, is there any trend toward cufflinks? I don't know that I've seen an uptick in the trend in cufflinks. Um, those sales are still solid with us. Uh, we, we have very good interest in nice cufflinks, but I, I don't think that I've seen prices jump. Jill, you have been asked to spell the kind of tourmaline you just referred to. <laughs> I, I promise this is not You're a putting me on the spot. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, to, to the person who asks that question, email Jill and she will be happy to respond to you with all the information on that particular subject that you may ever want. How's that? We'll and do no it doubt we have some coming up for auction too. We do, we there do. So I'm going to end it with this last question because I think it's a very good one to, to ask as we wrap things up. John wants to know uh, about the flow of uh, consignments pre and post pandemic because certainly people, uh, you know, we, we have there was a very early discussion in March and April about how do we assure folks that consigning is safe, that we can come visit them or they can consign with us. Uh, how has that been handled over the last few months? Has Have folks begun to become more comfortable with consigning? Uh, certainly as, as we add sales, that certainly says to me uh, that there is no shortage of people wanting to, uh, to spread the wealth as it were. It's with the, with the with zoom with video conferencing with smartphones it is so much easier to communicate with our clients all over the world um i'm also using whatsapp with my international clients who want to reach me that way just hit me up via email first and you can do that with every specialist um i am taking consignments in from france from hong kong from barcelona different from Australia, different parts of the world. Um, nobody seems to have any issue working uh, with me without being with me in person. So with FedEx and DHL and technology, um, we can certainly do a lot of business. It was a struggle at first, don't you think, Jill, at the beginning of last year? I think we had to change the way we approached business for those of us who are sort of uh, the traditional auction house people, we were used to getting on a plane and running and scattering, you know, everywhere the wind blew us to acquire pieces and the pandemic forced us to slow down and to rethink what we were doing to work smarter. And I think Gina is absolutely right with Zoom and FaceTime and all of the different, you know, putting images on Instagram. It, it's really been a tremendous change that's happened very quickly. Look at where we've come in a year in terms of everyone's use of technology, their understanding of it, and their comfort level. And she is absolutely correct. We might spend more time working with people so that they do feel comfortable with us. They trust us. We have a, a big 
brick and mortar business that is supported by an online element that makes us very strong. And I think people still appreciate knowing that there is that brick and mortar entity backing us up. Well, I'm going to end it there, but I am going to say this. It's P-A-R-A-I-B-A. -A. <laughs> but all that aside, feel free, please, to email Jill and Gina. I will let them give out their email addresses one more time before we wrap things up here. Jill? Jill B at H-A dot com. I'm going to forego my email address and tell you to go to <laughs> ha.com slash jewelry because we have a big team. And depending on where you are, you might be more suited to working with Tracy in Palm Beach, Jessica or Vera in New York, Jamie in Chicago, or um, Jill, of course, and Sabrina in Dallas, and myself and Anna in Los Angeles or the surrounding areas like Vegas or Arizona. We do cover in San Francisco, Northern California, and Washington. So please go to ha.com slash jewelry. We're all here to help you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. And don't forget, February 5th is the next Friday Night Jewels on online auction. It's not Friday Night Lights, although it kind of is. Friday Night Jewels, February 5th. Jill, Gina, I really appreciate you doing this. And I appreciate everyone who's joined us, everyone who's asked terrific questions. Uh, there are still some folks with some questions outstanding. Feel free to email them to Gina or Jill or their team. Uh, and we'll be back to do another one of these uh, sometime soon. But I really, really do appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Robert. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.